Hello, Wills, and thanks for joining me. Now, you're currently Vice President for Policy in Europe at Genzyme. So what kind of business activities does that principally entail? Well, I'm mostly responsible for creating an external environment that's ensuring that patients can get access to treatments. So this means working on the external stakeholders, but of course working together with my colleagues here in Brussels, but also in the countries, and actually also working together with the other companies that are involved in the rare disease space. I think one of the most interesting things that we've been doing together recently is being part of setting up the EU Committee of Experts on Rare Diseases. So this is a committee of experts which has been established by the European Commission and it brings together stakeholders from all the member states, uh, from academics, from patients, but also has membership from the industry and together with seven of my colleagues from other companies, we are working together as part of that committee to create an external policy program that will hopefully improve the diagnosis, treatment and care for rare disease patients in Europe. Um, another area that we're working together on is the Joint Industry Task Force on Orphan Drugs and Rare Diseases. And this is jointly Secretariat uh, of EBE and Europa Bio, the two trade associations here in Brussels, and it brings together all the companies that are involved in the research and development of orphan drugs and treatments for rare diseases. So it's a very collaborative job. Um, I have a strong network inside and outside the company, but I think that's one of the hallmarks of the rare disease space, uh, collaboration and working together. And obviously we are focusing today on, on discussing the area of rare diseases and the associated orphan drugs um, ahead of the Orphan Drug Summit in Copenhagen later this year. But I guess one, one point just to clarify before we go further is to really define how you state something as being an orphan drug. What defines that? Mm. So it's a good question. Many countries have decided that orphan drugs are an area that's worthy of support. So we're thinking about Europe as a region. We think about the USA, but Korea as well, and, and several other regions and countries. But the definition of what an orphan drug is differs from region to region and from country to country. So in the US, for example, it was a cut-off figure of a finite number of 200,000 patients, whereas in the European Union, it's a prevalence figure, which means that the European Union, as it grew, would still have a regulation that was viable and valid. And for the European Union, the prevalence figure is one of 5 in 10,000 patients. Right. But what's interesting from a European perspective is there are other specific clauses that are in there that basically says it's not enough that a disease is rare, but there also has to be a high unmet medical need and no existing treatment. In other words, you basically have to prove that not only are you putting together a drug or developing a drug for a disease that is rare, but it also has to be a disease that is rare and serious, chronically debilitating, life-threatening. And on top of that, you have to prove that either there's no existing satisfactory treatment or the treatment that you're proposing offers some form of significant benefit to the patients in question. So that's very, very important from a European perspective, the concept that rarity is not enough. It has to be rare and serious and there must be no treatment or what you're bringing offers something better for the patient. And you actually have to prove that in clinical trials. So clearly significant benefit for the patients involved in these areas. But looking at it from the drug developer's perspective, what benefits come with being granted orphan drug status? So again, those differ from country to country, from region to region. But where governments have decided these are a special class of drugs for a specific class of patients that need special attention, they've set in place, exactly as you've said, they've set in place incentives or support that encourage companies to come and have themselves designated as an orphan drug. So talking about Europe, of course, we have those benefits that are contained in the regulation. And the regulation covers marketing authorization. So during your development phase, you could ask for protocol assistance, which is free scientific advice from the European Medicines Agency on how to design your clinical trials. 
you can also benefit from fee waivers and fee reductions in the whole development and marketing authorization process. Um, beyond that, you also have something that's called market exclusivity. And this one always makes me um, smile a little bit because the name would suggest some form of monopoly. However, sure. as I've just referred to, um, you could have a situation where there's no existing treatment, where in which case we want to encourage a treatment that is proven to be safe, it's proven to work, it's proven to be of high quality in the same way that any other drug uh, has to prove when it receives a marketing authorization in Europe. But it also, if, it, if there is another treatment, the new treatment would have to prove that it brings a significant benefit. So in other words, the market exclusivity, despite its name, is actually much more of a psychological benefit because right. there's always that possibility to break it if you bring a significant benefit to the patient. And we see of that, course. for example, there are four or five treatments for pulmonary arterial hypertension here in Europe. And there are different treatments in, even in areas that are very, very rare, such as the diseases that we treat. Okay. And just looking at some of the incentives you outlined there for development of orphan drugs, how does that impact on the cost of developing drugs in these areas and developing orphan drugs versus broader disease areas? Well, I think one of the main starting points from a European legislative perspective is that patients suffering from rare diseases deserve the same level of quality and safety and efficacy for their drugs as any other patient would deserve. So we have the challenge of developing uh, a rare disease treatment, developing a drug for that, and getting it through the European system. So that's the first part. But beyond that, there are multiple specific challenges that we find in the rare disease space. So right from the very beginning in discovery and development, the, the development of an orphan medicinal product is often accompanied by only partial knowledge of the disease in question. Um, you may not have very uh, strong animal models. You may not have a lot of the typical support that you have in more common diseases. And when you get to clinical trials, of course, you're going to have small populations of patients that are eligible for the clinical trials because these diseases are rare. But they might be scattered widely across the region or even internationally. And so when you're doing a clinical trial, very often you have to gather together the patients into a center. And considering that a lot of the rare diseases affect children, you may also have to take into account that you have to bring the families or the carers of the children as well to be near, to be in proximity to that clinical trial center. Then when you get through the marketing, and, uh, the marketing authorization registration phase, you may have quite a complicated dossier with a rather small data set, again, because the diseases are rare. So you have to work with the regulators to try and understand what the evidence shows and then what needs to be demonstrated after the positive risk-benefit analysis has been made. And so even after the marketing authorization, we very often have follow-up studies, registries, and also, of course, an ongoing commitment to educate the treating community at large because one of the interesting things is awareness of an individual rare disease often remains very low until there's a treatment available. And then suddenly sure. you get the investment in raising awareness, you get the educational programs to help people recognize and diagnose this, and that, of course, continues to build up the knowledge that we have, both of the disease, but also of the effectiveness and the clinical relevance of the new treatment that has been approved. So I guess what I'm trying to say is there are challenges at every stage of the development process, um, and any company that wants to be in this really has to be in it for the long haul. So if we look at the scenario that you're sort of painting there, Wills, we have obviously extensive development costs still for these drugs. We have educational needs, which again can be quite costly but obviously by definition, smaller patient populations, which means a higher price point for the drug in order for it to be commercially viable, I guess. So how do you deal with the market access challenges that can present? 
I think that it's certainly true. Many of the orphan drugs that we see coming to the market do have a higher price point than you would see typically for most, but not all, common diseases. Sure. Um, I think the, the, main, the main way we have to approach this and the main way that we have to look at this is by an ongoing series of dialogues. Um, that might sound trite, but realistically, the only way that we're going to be able to create sustainable, long-term, relevant market access programs at country level for these patient populations who, let's face it, up until the creation of the orphan drug regulation did not have a treatment for their disease, um, is by continuing with this dialogue with all of the stakeholders. Um, and I think for the most part, we also have to remember that the people that are taking the decisions about pricing and reimbursement are trying to do their job. And their job is, of course, to make sure that taxpayers' money, because it's taxpayers' money that funds the healthcare systems in Europe, they're trying to make sure that the taxpayers' money for which they're responsible is spent in the most cost-effective, the most useful, the most relevant, and the most responsible way. So I think our role is to help the government understand the impact of a disease, the clinical benefits and relevance of a treatment to the patient, and to help them understand that this is actually a very, very defined population. And I think if we can continue that dialogue as we have done over the past 10 plus years here in Europe, we have the possibility to find a shared solution. Um, I can understand that a lot of governments are looking at the success of the orphan drug regulation here in Europe, and we have more or less 70 drugs that have received a positive opinion since 2000, since the enactment of the orphan drug regulation. And these governments are trying to work out how they're going to deal with the current numbers of orphan drugs and how they're going to deal with the orphan drugs of the future. And I think the only way we can do this is to figure it out together. And I think that's one of the nice things about working for Genzyme is we've always had the reputation of being collaborative and being part of the community that's working on these shared solutions. So um, one thing that I think is important to note here is an ongoing discussion around something which is essentially coverage with evidence development. And since about 2008, there's been an increasing collaborative dialogue between the countries and the other stakeholders in Europe to try and understand how can we deal with an orphan drug with a limited data set, with a high unmet medical need, a potentially high price, and a waiting patient population. And these are proposals that are in development even as we speak, and we're hoping that we're going to see some more concrete advances in the next six to 18 months around this collaborative approach. Okay, okay. And as you mentioned, obviously 70 drugs or so achieving orphan status is a, is a fairly significant number, but I guess there are an even greater number of rare um, or orphan diseases which are out there. So you, know, you look at the current regulatory framework, do you think it goes far enough to support development of drugs in these areas? I think the challenge of developing orphan drugs and treatments for rare diseases is inherently a very, very complex field. Um, I would argue that the European regulatory framework is extremely strong. It does the job. And it's one of the things that we should absolutely safeguard. There are, of course, challenges in many different respects of discovery development marketing authorization and market access. But I think the fundamental thing that we can say is that the orphan drug regulation in Europe is delivering the goods. And we should hang on to that and we should look at what we had before and we should look at what we have now and we should say this is a good piece of legislation and we should defend it and make sure that it's something that is respected and continues to be respected in the future. I think the next part 
of the framework is actually in the hands of the member state because each member state has to decide is this a patient population that we want to treat and so this goes back to what I was saying before there needs to be an ongoing dialogue that helps the government understand the burden of the disease the clinical benefit and relevance of the treatment in question and then governments need to make decisions on how they spend their money so I think that looking at whether we keep the regulation, build on the regulation, is not so much the question. I think the regulation is working. I think where we need to continue to do more work is with the countries, and I think the national plans for rare diseases that each government signs up to are going to be a real strong element of making sure that patients do get access to the right drugs and drugs that are really going to make a difference. So if I understand what you're saying correctly, it's, it's, you really think the regulatory platform is in a pretty good place there. And if we look forward, say, four or five years, you think the changes are really going to come from increased collaboration as is happening now and increased dialogue with local governments? Very much so. Very much so. Because we're not going to be able to <clears throat> overcome scientific challenges by a regulatory framework. We're sure. only going to be able to overcome scientific challenges and find treatments for diseases that are inherently difficult to treat by collaborating and collaborating at all levels, collaborating in early research, in development, collaborating between the countries as they try and figure out how do we share data, how do we collaborate on creating centers of expertise and sharing not just data but also sharing the best knowledge we have about the diseases and how to treat them. So collaboration at all levels is the only way that we're going to try and make some headway into treating the vast majority of rare diseases that don't have a treatment. Because 70 drugs are nice, but there are thousands of diseases out there without any kind of treatment. And that's the bit that we need to continue to work on. Sure. Well, let's hope that continued collaboration does yield some results both for um, yourself and other companies involved in this space. So, um, Will, thanks very much for your time. It's been really good to hear your perspective on this, and uh, I hope you find the Orphan Drug Summit useful. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about this. It's an area I'm very passionate about, um, and I'm looking forward to the summit too. So thank you very much. Thank you.